Hello and welcome to the Sociology Show podcast. My guest for this episode is the fantastic Professor Jack Katz talking all about seductions of crime. Before we go over to the interview, just a couple of messages. So firstly, a message for students listening. The Sociology Show podcast now offers online tutoring. If you're interested in booking a single session or multiple sessions, whether you want one hour, hour and a half, two hours, whatever it may be, then you can book up a tutoring session. Simply go to calendly.com forward slash sociology show tutoring that's calendly c-a-l-e-n-d-l-y dot com forward slash sociology show tutoring a message for teachers listening as well if you would like some help maybe you are setting up a new department for sociology perhaps you're thinking about switching exam boards Perhaps you want some extra help in terms of how to answer questions, what the examiners are looking for, or maybe you've got staff within your department which are non-specialists, whatever it may be. If you are interested in booking me for some consultancy work for either a half day or a full day, then please do get in touch on my email address, which is the Sociology Show podcast at gmail.com. So without further ado, let's go over to the interview with Professor Jack Katz. Hi, you're listening to The Sociology Show, a podcast about absolutely anything to do with the wonderful world of sociology. Whether you're a teacher, a lecturer, a student, or just taking a passing interest, this podcast will look at a range of issues from social class, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, religion, crime, education, and anything else that sociology has to offer. My name is Matthew Wilkin, and each episode I will speak to someone working in the field of sociology and let them explain all about their own interests, their research, and their experiences. So, put your earphones in, turn the volume up, and let's be sociology geeks together, eh? Hello, and welcome to the Sociology Show podcast. Would you like to start by telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do, please? Okay, so... I'm Jack Katz, and I've been doing sociology for maybe 40 years. Uh, I was initially trained as a lawyer and then went into sociology graduate school. And what I do, uh, I work on a number of different topics. Of course, crime, which is why you're talking to me today. Also, emotions, self. Uh, in everyday life, uh, and I've been doing a long-term uh, project on uh, neighborhoods in Hollywood, uh, an area in Los Angeles that's famous for the the movies, but also has interesting people living there and how it's changed the kind of stuff in urban sociology. So I work on a lot of different topics, and I'm as enthusiastic as ever about sociology and what you can learn. I'm stimulated every day by it. Uh, yeah, so as we go along, I think you'll get a sense of how my perspective is similar or different than what other sociologists do. Great. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. And uh, the main reason I want to talk to you today is uh, about your, your book, Seductions of Crime. Sociology students are always really interested in it because most of the research that you look at in understanding crime and criminology very much comes from sort of social economics, trying to understand inequalities, poverty, money. Students learn about things like strain theory, status frustration and so on. And yours really kind of leaps out as something a little bit different and sort of approaching and trying to understand why crime occurs from a very different angle. Um, so I wondered if you you wouldn't mind sort of expanding on that in terms of how you take a slightly different look at why crime occurs. Yeah, I, it's a good question and uh, helps me kind of open up uh, how what I do is different. Basically, I look at the thing we're trying to understand. Okay, you can... There's different vocabularies for this, but you can talk about the independent variable and the dependent variable. We can talk about the explanons, the thing that's going to do the explaining, and the explanandum, the thing you're trying to explain. Almost everybody, especially in criminology, but generally in sociology, is looking at the explainer, the cause, and the debates are all about, is it a lack of self-discipline? Is it something in the way the child was raised that leads them to be a criminal? 
Is it something about poverty? Is it something about race or ethnic or minority status? Is it something about neighborhood? And in each of these uh, causes have different sociologists associated with. You could probably go down the list of the different theories that your students are looking at and associate different sociologists. Their careers are tied to different causes, different exponents, different independent variables. Most recently, neighborhood, at least in the U.S. I don't, I, and some work in, in England too, and in other countries, emphasizes the neighborhood character, life history studies that Farrington and others have sustained in England. That look, is there a difference between lifelong offenders and those who just offend in adolescence? Is that related? That difference related to something in the family and early childhood. So all the action, all the status differences among academics is on the exponent side. Everybody on the other side, the thing you're trying to explain, everybody takes crime rates pretty much. Some people do studies where they have interview, they interview people who self-report whether they offended or not, but most mostly people are trying to explain. So that's not where the action is. The action is not on the side of the thing you're trying to explain. The intellectual action is all on the cause side. And so my, my difference is essentially, I'm, I start by looking at the thing we're trying to understand. And to me, that's the way a natural scientist operates. It's, and I think often people read seductions and they think I'm saying people do it for the thrill that background isn't important. That's not really the organizing idea of the book. The organizing perspective is to look, get as close as you can, see in as much detail, whatever it is you're trying to understand. I've done that in my other studies, like when I studied emotions, I did videotapes of people laughing in a fun house videotapes of little kids crying and to try to understand the dynamics of those emotional events. Uh, to me, that's what, that's a scientific impulse. You try to get and see as far out into the universe as you can. Technologies are allowing us to do. You look under the microscope, you look at DNA, you look at the structure, you're just trying to describe and then see process and you build towards cause from first looking at the thing you're trying to explain. So that's, I think that's why my work is very different. The action in academics and in politics is all on the cause side. And I think the action in, the action in the sense of what motivates, what organizes the careers of, of academics especially in criminology, is very politically tied. Mm -hmm. If you look at all the causes that people cite for crime, whether it's the lack of self-discipline or uh, neighborhood quality or poverty, racial discrimination, they're all tied to different political programs. And, and everybody takes that for granted. That's what you should be doing. You should be emphasizing the cause side. My approach is to start on the, the thing you're trying to explain. You don't quite know what it is. If you knew what, if you had an accurate sense of the thing you're trying to explain, you wouldn't have to do the research. But you have some something important going on out there. Explain, and then you, you look at process, you look at life cycle, you look at the course of an event, and then you try to build towards an explanation, you try to find causes and contingencies of change behavior that way. So that's what I would encourage your students. Mm. I, I would also say, well, maybe it's a personality thing, but I'm either paranoid or suspicious about what government tells us. So most sociologists who study crime are very happy from Durkheim on, right? I mean, they're very happy to take official statistics, whether it's suicide or crime. And Say, okay, that, that gives us what we're trying to explain. Now let's look for the cause. Well, I'm not comfortable with that. I don't 
I don't trust government. I don't trust government doesn't produce information on crime in order to serve social science. In some sense, criminology is a uh, an effort by academics to kind of get the police, the courts, the whole the judges, the whole criminal justice system to be their research agents, their their research assistants. Hmm. Not what the criminal justice system is in the business of doing. So when they produce statistics on crime, they produce the crime rates, it's for their own purposes. So when I started to study crime, which I just started to study in a way because I was starting to teach and I had to teach something. And I had a law background and I realized people studying crime never actually looked at what the people were doing very much. And that, so I just started to gather all the information I could on what people are actually doing in the moments of doing crime. And what are they doing just before? What are they doing just after? And I tried to build, I tried to find patterns. Should we, should we start with that then? Because you mentioned about perhaps a different methodology compared to what other people use. So for, for your book, Seductions of Crime, how, how did you approach it? You mentioned eth- um, ethnography, ethnographic research. Yeah, I just collected everything I could, all the biographies, autobiographies, all the close-up descriptions by journalists. Uh, I found a very nice data set that were collected by a couple of researchers in Chicago who didn't just take the police statistics, they went into the police files, and when you go into the, which it's hard to do, right? You, they spent a lot of time, and I piggybacked off of them, they spent a lot of time over years, getting good relations with the police department in Chicago so they could get into the files. And when you get into the files, you get the witness statements, you get the reports made on the scene when the cops first get there, you get sometimes offender statements, uh, you get raw, more raw material on what actually happened. So that was really helpful. So I put all that stuff together. In other studies, I've done videos that and, you know, one thing I'm working on now uh, with other people in Europe are uh, videos of people getting into fights that are recorded on iPhones or smartphones. Everybody's got a smartphone. Mm-hmm. Where your students, maybe they've done this themselves. They, you know, pulled out the phone. Something interesting is going on. And that stuff is posted on the web. And you get... For the first time in human history, you actually get firsthand immediate documentation of what's going on. And and it's a it's a real challenge to work up this material, but there it is for you. Uh, so that's a sort of way of working, at least to gather the data. That's I see this as a, the video material of the kind of new frontier that the next generation will spend a lot of time developing. Well, they find it's it's a wonderful education if you really try to just describe what's happening. Mm. You get a very fine sensibility of interaction, of how people are adjusting their behavior based on what they perceive others doing, how they're trying to influence others. Uh, and it should be useful for understanding the contingencies of starting violence, of progressions in violence, and of ending violence, of what bystanders do and so forth. But there, there, it's interesting to me, and I think instructive, that while these videos have become available, and there are a lot of them out of England, there are a lot of them in English language, out of the U.S., out of England, and a lot of these events happen in public transportation. Yeah. On buses, on uh, train cars, street cars, a lot of really ugly stuff happens, and there it is, not quite from the beginning, because somebody has to, usually, the recording starts after the event is already turned towards violence, but uh, you get at more of a complete documentation of what actually happens in violence than we've ever seen before. And it's striking that criminology is barely looking at this. I mean, what, what would you want to look at if you're a criminologist? But this is the stuff. Yeah, it's kind of like you can see cancer, you can see a progression, you can see the, the cells uh, metastasizing, and, and you don't want to look at it. You want to look at some statistics. It's crazy. 
The Sociology Show podcast relies on the kind contributions of sponsorship and donations. If you enjoy the show, then you can help with the hosting costs by donating as little as £5 on the GoFundMe page. Simply visit uk.gofundme.com and search for The Sociology Show. If you can donate, then you will be sent a Sociology Show pen as a small thank you for your continued support of the show. I, I was just thinking, it, like the example you gave, you know, the, the people whipping out their smartphones to record a fight. That sort of brings me on to the first question that one of my students asked, because the full title of your book, I'm just going to read it, Seductions of Crime, Moral and Sensual Attractions in Doing Evil. Um, we are all fascinated. We're all interested. You know, if something does go viral and it's a fight on a bus or something like that. Uh, so do you mind explain what you mean by the sensual attraction of crime to start with? Yeah. Uh, you know, you think of it this way. Whatever background factors may be important in the theology and the kind of path towards uh, and a violent attack, or a theft, they're there, they're not active, they're not controlling the person until a certain moment in a certain situation. What happens in that? Some change of behavior, some change of perception happens that makes it attractive, compelling, productive to act right now. And that's the transition that I'm focusing on today. And that is you know, all of a sudden, it feels, the moment feels right. Well, let's do, okay, let's, let's steal that from the store. Let's, you know, break that window. Let's, uh, I'm going to attack that guy. It turns out that actually when you look at, like, these violence people, I have in mind because I've been working on that recently, the attacker usually is in a dominant position. Often, okay, they can say they've been threatened, they've been challenged, but when they attack, they're in a dominant position. So it feels right. They have a sense of power, of advantage. Well, that's a seduction. That's a seduction. It's a, it's a feeling, so that's why I call it aesthetic. And it's moral in the sense of uh, either it's specifically, I'm going to defend my honor, get respect. Mm-hmm. Or it's, you know, I don't, I don't know what you do with vulgarity on these videos. No, that's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna fuck this guy over. I mean, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna break his balls. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ally with the power of destruction and triumph and feel that through my body. Okay, when you attack, when you get violent, you organize yourself, your whole body into a weapon, right? I mean, if you're a good boxer, you want to stay loose, right? But in order to generate power, you've got to discipline a whole series of muscles in your body to be effective. And so that's an aesthetic, a sensual attraction. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a tough guy, I'm gonna get, which isn't just a metaphor. It's like I'm going to toughen up my body to be effective in how I attack. So, you know, each of the kinds of violence or theft or deviance that I'm identifying, describing the book, their sensual and moral attractions is different, but that's the critical shift that all of a sudden it feels right. That's why, that's why the background factors, however poor you were, or however discriminated against, however lousy your schooling, or however lousy your neighborhood, or however cool your father was, however victimized you were in one way or another, you don't constantly offend. You don't constantly steal or beat people up. Something happens in that moment. And that shift is because all of a sudden it, it seems like the right thing to do. Also, it's positive. It's interesting if you look at all the explanations of crime that are out there that are popular, they're all negative things. There's a kind of moral symmetry that seems to govern the way people think about crime. Crime is bad. Hmm. Most people think it's bad. So what can explain it? It must be something bad. 
poverty bad, racial discrimination is bad, you know, coming from a broken family is bad, coming from a neighborhood that doesn't have good social services, that's bad. So you could see that all, basically all the explanations of crime out there are something bad causes something bad. And that's basically a kind of non-rational, mythological way of explaining things. It has an ancient history that's in all societies, has always been part of the way people think in society. If you know the crops fail, it must be because somebody violated uh, the, the rules you know, prohibitions that the gods insist on. So we have to find that person and do something to make the gods content. Something bad happens. People are getting sick. Another group is attacking us. We got to find something bad, somebody to blame. Uh, that's an ancient kind of way of looking at things. But in fact, what happened in the actual doing of time is that it seems positive. Like I'm going to achieve something. I'm attracted to it. It's positive. That's why seduction in the title has some, some relevance. That's why it's the right term, I think, because it's, it's a version of something positive. Because you also also use the word, you know, you mentioned sensual, uh, uh, seductive. Uh, the word that often raises an eyebrow with students is that the word arousal, you know, or uh, or even the word sexual. So how do you how do you attach sort of arousal to the idea of criminality? You know, there's a lot you can do a lot for the sexual metaphor, you know, penetration, violation, going beyond a protected boundary. Uh, taking the risk, projecting yourself into somebody else's world, all these things. And, you know, the fact that the kinds of behaviors we're thinking about when we think about crime, theft, and violence, peak in adolescence, isn't coincidental. Hmm. Sexual. And the fact that males are doing it these activities at five to 10 times the rate females are. And female participation, even when it occurs, is often very different than process. That's not unrelated to sexual dynamics. Now, I, I think I get a little bit at that a little bit, because I do have some discussions in the book where I try to get the background factors, like the sexual difference. Uh, often there's this odd pattern that when women murder and they're asked about it, they can't recount what was going on at the time. Mm. Males can. And it's it seems to be difficult for more difficult for females to reconcile organizing their bodies in violence more difficult than it is for men. You know, for men, you're just you're being a hard man. You're being, you know, which a stick-up guy, which is a, a phallic metaphor. It's, it's very straightforward, not subtle. Uh, for women, that doesn't a lot of them who do violence. It's hard for them to reconcile who they are in the violence with who they are in the rest of their lives. Yeah. Could I, could I ask you about that? Because I, I was really interested because, you know, if we look at evidence of things like um, vandalism or graffiti, arson, setting something on fire, they are predominantly male acts. So what what's essentially or arousal? What 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 are men getting from it that women don't? You're being masculine. Right. In conventional sense. You're being tough. You're being assertive. You're, you know, doing violence. You're organizing your body into a into a hard tool, basically, mm. which is like a you know a metaphor for sex. I mean, think of the the cocky way men walk when they're trying to. Do. Mm. Well, all these metaphors are not accidentally <laughs> close 
uh, one to the other to violent activity. Let me say just one other thing, something before, because I, if your students want to understand how to do this work, uh, I, I wrote a like four pages, very short, little essay uh, called on analytic induction, and it's I think pretty accessible. It's in an uh, international encyclopedia of social science. They can find it on the web. It's open access. Uh, but that'll kind of show you how you do this work and how it's different than how social scientists often uh, work. And there are examples of studies in other fields, not just crime. But if you want to pursue this and start your own investigations, and even, you know, your students who are in high school, or what we call high school, that's a good time to start because I mean, I think basically what I'm doing is continuing who I was when I was an adolescent yeah. in the perspective I had. I think this is, you find, and I would encourage your students, you know, find a way of working that continues who you are, that helps you, you know, you get a lot of motivation out of that. Like your work reflects back on concerns you have on an ongoing basis and that gives you motivation thank you thank you for that can i throw a few more terms at you that often come up for that student ask for a little bit more clarification on um mm. you mentioned that the the stick up guy doing the stick up <laughs> do you just want to explain what what that means I mean, you know, in the U.S., it's a phrase for robbery. I don't know in the U.K. whether... It is occasionally used, yeah, the stick up, yeah. Yeah, yeah stick them up, uh, you know, which... I mean, you know, put your hands up, uh, as you're illustrating. But it's also a phallic kind of metaphor. So, you know, being a hard man and so forth. Uh, these are feared of often admired personalities. Dominance is, is a large part of the attraction. I have a chapter, Ways of the Badass, that doesn't focus on a particular uh, crime-like event, but is just a way of being that sometimes ends up in violence or exploitation. But uh, that came out of really a memory I had. One of my first jobs, I was like a busboy waiter at a hotel and uh, where we we would uh, stay there. It wasn't like commuting every day. It's like a resort kind of place. You go stay there. We lived in like what had been stalls for horses that were converted. And the first night I got there, we would had roommates. And I my roommate guy they called Dillinger out of uh, he was a boxer, but Dillinger was a famous American criminal who escaped the law for a long time. He was finally shot down at the Biograph Theater in the 30s. And this guy, he told me, somebody's going to come up to you, and they're going to ask you to borrow some money. And it's not going to be a lot of money. And you're going to think, I got the money. You know, they'll ask me for a dollar, two dollars. And you're going to think, well, I, I need to have friends here. I don't know people. I'll give them the money. But don't give them the money. If you give them the money, and I, I mean, he didn't explain a lot, I don't think, if I recall right. But I, what I came to understand is that if I give this guy the money the first day I'm there, the rest of the summer, because of the summer job, the rest of the summer, I'm going to be looking to that guy to get paid back. And he's not going to pay me back. <laughs> and so what's going to happen is he's going to be robbing me the whole summer. Like it starts out as a loan, but then it turns into robbery. It's a dominance thing. Mm. Not that he needs a dollar or two dollars. It's that that dominance in a world of males, and we were all males, no females. Well, that's a masculine thing. And, you know, when you get into masculine things, you're never very far from sexuality. 
So the next day, in fact, this guy comes up to me. He's not a big guy. He's not an intimidating guy. And he says, hey, Jack, you know, I'm a little short. Can you give me a buck? I want to get hamburger. And I said, you know what? I was just about to ask you because I'm short too. <laughs> and, and that's a bill. Because they were a judge, juvenile delinquents. And the head waiter would recruit these guys from the judge in the Lower East Side in Manhattan. And this would be a way they would avoid jail, come out and do this work. So these were interesting guys. They're fun. It was a good instructor summer. But that, I always had that in mind when I was writing like Ways of the Bad. I, I was thinking, you know what? You know, these events when somebody goes in and punches somebody or somebody goes in and steals something or robs, that's not what this is about, really. Mm. The real thing to explain is the attractions of the Ways of the Bad as a dominance of how you can do something and it only has the power, this kind of asking a person for money and not paying it back. It only has power if the other people understand you're doing something bad and you're getting away with it. That's where you generate the power. The, 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 the rule that you should pay back, otherwise it's robbery, that allows this guy with a little phrase, hey, can you give me a buck? Can you lend me a buck? How can you not lend the guy a buck? A buck's a big deal. And that, little, that innocent little phrase becomes a, a summer-long robbery. Yeah. Uh, and it comes worse and worse every day. I, I can't help hearing um, "stick up" and "ways of the bad badass" without thinking about um, Pulp Fiction, <laughs> you know, the, the film, which uh, I think both both are made reference to, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of people you know, creating culture, movies, writing scripts, writing books—they're responsive to uh, all these symbols. They're not they're getting it from me. It's just I'm getting it from the same place they are, from the world of, you know, people who are living in this thing, for whom it's motivating. You know, the Joe Pesci character, if yeah. I think uh, he's very, you know, the people doing uh, the new streets, that whole series of movies, they're very responsive. These are people, like, these are very much like people I knew from New York. They were responding to the same thing I was, the same dramatic kind of dramatics of everyday life. Thank you. And if it's okay with you, I just wanted to um, ask you two more things, one one at one end of the scale and one at the other end of the scale. So at one end of the scale, you, you talk about the sneaky thrills, okay, um, which students are always interested in. So do you mind just explaining what, what that means and some examples, if that's okay? Yeah, it's usually, you know, I ask my students in, at UCLA uh, anonymously, Describe to me any uh, kind of thefts that you did or little transgressions and what they were about. And over a couple of years, I got dozens and dozens of these reports. Some of them were frankly bullshit, you could tell. Uh, but others were detailed and they. Well, they fit together in that the people who were often shoplifting, stealing something. Uh, I remember one of the reports was stealing a pizza off the back of a truck. I remember the, the account was, we weren't even hungry, but that was the tastiest pizza we ever ate. This is to say, it was actually the transgression. Mm -hmm. That was the attraction. It's the whole drama of can I pass as looking normal when I'm in this store? It's not just the thing. In fact, the thing some often thrown away, it's neglected. They had the money in their pocket to buy it if they want it. It's not like they're really poor. And that's why even if they are poor, it's not like they needed this thing. So what is really at stake here? Well, what's really at stake is showing that you can get away. You can be seen as normal while you have these deviant thoughts. And for people approaching sexuality, you know, if people know what you're thinking all the time, if they really, if everybody really knew what you were thinking all the time, I mean, my God, how could you go <laughs> off? You better be able to, because what you're thinking, no, you couldn't, 
you couldn't defend it. So it's very important for you to realize. I remember when my own kids were young, and they would do these embarrassing things, and I kept hoping, why don't they get to the age already when they have to hide this stuff? I don't even want to know about it. You know, but so eventually, now they're pretty good at hiding from me. Well, but they became pretty good at hiding stuff from me. That's what's at stake. Eh? You know, this is a puberty, adolescent, pre adolescent, the age of adolescence, in adolescence kind of phenomenon. And then, <clears throat> you know, it can fade off. And that's one of the reasons that these crimes, vandalism as well, uh, are very. Graffiti, okay? You come at night when nobody's looking, you put your name up and you disappear. Okay, there's something in you you want known, but you don't want people seeing it that it's you. It's come, I want to be known, but not known. Yeah. Put your name up everywhere. Uh, but on the other hand, you don't want them to identify with you and, and arrest you. So there's a tremendous attraction in adolescence for... Sneaky thrill, proving you can get away with it, whatever the hell it is. It's not that important. I think we've probably all done that one, haven't we? And from from sneaky thrills, right at the other end of the scale, then, is uh, your section on cold-blooded, senseless murder, it's called. Yeah, I mean, if if we, for example, you know, the, the sneaky thrills, I think we can all get our head around that. We can understand of it. Trying to act like a badass, doing the stick up, you know, demonstrating masculinity. But I think it's a little bit more difficult to understand why someone would commit such an extreme act. Um, and what's the just, you know, are they trying to justify it in some way or is it is it something that's just gone beyond their control? You know, what, what I've done since that book, I did a, one paper on school, what intimate massacres, I call it, the school shooting. So let's talk about that example mm. because it becomes important to break down what the government and what journalists consider all one category into the subcategory. So let me talk about school shooting. Uh, there's lots of things going on in school shooting. And we have many more here. You have some experience with us, but because it's done availability so great of many more of these things. Uh, but in some one subset of them, what's going on in what I call intimate massacres, that is or attacking others in places that they think have a very intimate understanding of who they are. And they're trying to destroy that understanding. So that becomes that it's not that they're trying to achieve anything. In fact, they often don't have much of a plan to get away. And what's going on in that kind of cold-blooded, senseless, what we call cold-blooded, senseless murder, is a destruction of the image that the attacker thinks others, even if they don't, even if they don't even know the attacker thing, they have this image of and they're trying to destroy that. And sometimes they destroy, remember in some of these events, they kill their mother. They kill people very close to them who could give a different account of who they are. They want to get rid of that version of themselves without constructing anything new. And just going back to, to what you said right earlier on in the show, that all of these crimes, male, male dominated, other than the sort of the demonstration of of masculinity, what else is going on there? How, how can we explain or understand it through a gendered lens? We're talking now pretty much about physical theft and violence. And we think of that as male, and we think of that as associated with poverty, lack of opportunity, and so forth. But white color crime, corruption, fraud, theft, in, in devious means, not paying your taxes, cheating people, all kinds of internet fraud these days, may well be much more common 
And the masculine dominance may not be the same. Or it may be. People haven't really looked into it. The kinds of crimes we're talking about, like kind of physical, you break into some place, or you're physically violent or something. It's a way of being masculine that fits better uh, with men than it does with women. Uh, on the other hand, fraud, conspiracy, uh, cheating may well be a different gender balance. Mm -hmm. So I think it has to do with how these acts fit into who you are in the rest of your life. It's not like you do these things separate from the rest of your life. This has to be an extension of the rest of your life. So if we look at what, what's called white color crime, we might find a very different gender, male or female, and make those activities consistent with you. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. I always um, end by asking if people want to find out more about your work or uh, read some more of your literature, how can they get in touch or find more, find out more about you? Well, uh, you know, you can. I, my email from UCLA is, uh, and I have a Gmail email address as well. But you can find me on the web very easily. I have a, an article that should be coming out in the next year called "Beyond the Seduction of the State," and you can look for that, and that will articulate how my approach is suspicious of government and of the state and how so much of criminology goes along with the state. And that might be a kind of guide to how to read a whole range of different mm -hmm. contributions and criminology that are alternative from that. And some perhaps uh, specify what's different about that. Right? Brilliant. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, everybody's easy to find. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. I really, really do appreciate your time. Sorry, I said it'd be about 30 minutes. So I've taken up more of your time. So I really do appreciate you giving up your time for me today, Jack. What a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. The Sociology Show podcast relies on the kind contributions of sponsorship and donations. If you enjoy the show, then you can help with the hosting costs by donating as little as £5 on the GoFundMe page. Simply visit uk.gofundme.com and search for The Sociology Show. If you can donate, then you will be sent a Sociology Show pen as a small thank you for your continued support of the show. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the podcast. If you would like to contact the show or be interviewed, then please email the Sociology Show podcast at gmail.com.